Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Cattler, and I'm Foreign Secretary and one of the Vice Presidents of the Royal Society. And it's a real pleasure to welcome <coughs> both those in the room and those who are joining us virtually to the 2021 Science and Civilization Lecture on Academic Freedom, Right or Privilege. The Royal Society is delighted to partner with the Council for Academics at Risk, CARA, on this event. Dara, CARA does absolutely vital work in ensuring at-risk academics can seek refuge from violence, conflict and persecution and reach a place where they may continue their work in safety. And I'm very pleased to welcome our friends and colleagues from CARA back to the Society. It is our privilege to welcome Professor Michael Ignatieff, who will be delivering tonight's lecture. Professor Ignatieff is a distinguished academic, writer, and former politician who has written and spoken widely on democracy, human rights, governance, and has been at the forefront of issues relating to academic freedom in recent years. As you are all no doubt aware, uh, and are about to hear in more detail, these are challenging times for academic freedom. All around the world, some increasingly authoritarian regimes and political movements have put increased pressure on already at-risk academics and have undermined their protections, some of which has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 crisis. It's therefore, I think, more important than ever to stand up for the rights and freedoms of scientists globally as we seek to embark on a sustainable, resilient, and hopefully inclusive recovery. Last year, the Royal Society published a statement on the need to support academic freedom. This statement makes clear that we consider academic freedom to be central to the practice of science. It attempts to define what academic freedom is, both for individuals and institutions, and it highlights some of the threats to that freedom. Please do go to our website, royalsociety.org, to read and share our statement. The Society also currently holds the chair of the UK Academy's Human Rights Committee, which brings together the academies of the UK to advocate for academic freedom and the individual rights of researchers to conduct their work around the world and to raise awareness of these issues more broadly. So before I hand over to Professor Ignatieff, let me just briefly outline the order of tonight's events and how you, the audience, can get involved in tonight's discussion, which we very much hope will happen. Following the lecture, there will be an opportunity for a Q&A session chaired by Sir Malcolm Grant, who is president of CARA, and we would welcome both those in the room and those joining us virtually uh, to participate using Slido. Now, for those in the room, please join by scanning the QR codes on your seats. And for those joining virtually, please join by clicking on the link on the events page. So I'm sure it will all work very smoothly. And then following the Q&A, uh, Professor Michael Wharton, Chair of CARA, will offer some closing remarks. I've also been asked to inform you that uh, we're not planning any fire practice this evening. If you hear the alarm go off, there are two exits from this room, but I, I sincerely hope that doesn't happen. But anyway, it's now a real pleasure uh, to ask Professor Ignatieff to present his lecture. Good evening. It's an understatement to say it's an honor to give a lecture at the Royal Society in any circumstances, and a particular honor to do it on behalf of CARA, the Council for At-Risk Academics. Um, you can't help but feel the history in the room in the home of Wren and Boyle, Wilkins, Hooke, and Newton is definitely the right place to celebrate the work of an organization that from the 1930s onwards has saved from the clutches of tyranny the likes of great scientists like the Nobel laureates Perutz, Krebs, and Born, and those great humanist scholars who shaped my own understanding when I was a student, men like Gombrich, Popper, and Elton. 
And it's also clear that an institution whose motto is nullius in verba, take nobody's word for it, is the right place to talk about what it takes to sustain freedom of thought in academic institutions at home and abroad. But first, let me start with a word about freedom. Um, there are those today who define freedom exclusively in terms of personal non-interference. <clears throat> Noli me tangere, don't touch me. And we hear this definition of freedom in anti-vaccination movements and on the libertarian fringes of modern conservatism. And you'll all remember that um, Isaiah Berlin, <clears throat> in Two Concepts of Liberty, distinguished between freedom from and freedom to, but these radical movements take freedom from to an absurd extreme. They appear also to take nullius in verba to mean take nobody's word for it except the last, the last fatuous rumor on the internet. Um, but this conception of freedom uh, seems to me is dangerous because it forgets that we're uniquely interdependent and social creatures. And both our health and our freedom depend on the care we take of the health and freedom of others, which is why you're safely distanced in this room tonight. My health is likely to be compromised if I fail to make any surrender of my personal liberty for the sake of your health. And my political freedom is unlikely to endure if I'm willing to defend yours. As with freedom in general, so with academic freedom in particular, any community of thinkers that enjoys the privileges of freedom should want these to be shared by all communities of thinkers. Knowledge is borderless, and it's to the benefit of all for it to circulate without let or hindrance. And universal access to knowledge in turn acknowledges an important fact about human beings that almost all of us have the capacity to think for ourselves and think creatively. Although, as we know, this capacity often is crushed in many souls because of injustice and cruelty. So we should value intellectual freedom, not as the privilege of the credentialed few who are in this hall tonight, but as the right of us all. And if so, we should always do what we can to defend the freedom of others, especially those who take positions that we disagree with. We do so in the hope that they'll come to the defense of our freedom when our freedoms are in danger. In the 1930s, the British academics who basically set up the origins of CARA and who raised hundreds of thousands of pounds in today's money to assist the emigration and resettlement of German academics, most of them Jewish, they understood this interdependence uh, in freedom. And when the new school in New York invited the entirety of the Frankfurt School to rehouse itself in America, they understood the same thing. And as we all know, in both Britain and the United States, the contribution of these refugee academics from Germany in the 1930s was simply transformative of every discipline that they uh, touched. And these luminous examples from the 1930s, I think, helped to clarify the question that is in the title of my talk, which is whether academic freedom is a right or a privilege. It's pretty obvious that to be able to write, to publish, to teach freely is not, the, is not a privilege, but a right that properly belongs to us all. And it's also, as I think we all are coming to realize, the epistemological condition for democratic freedom itself. If intellectual freedom is in danger, and there's evidence that it is, democratic freedom suffers. If democracy is in crisis today, it's in large measure an epistemological crisis because as citizens we no longer know what facts to believe or whose facts we should trust. And when we no longer know whom to trust, we quickly stop trusting ourselves. And that's a problem because trust in our own judgment is the very sheet anchor of democracy and democratic stability. So it's in this context that discussions of academic freedom acquire a relevance beyond the academy and raise the question of what obligations follow from the rights 
that, academic, that academics enjoy. Like all rights, these rights entail responsibilities, and they're responsibilities that this institution has been discharging for three centuries, that is to contribute learning and expertise for the benefit of society at large. And despite the populist pushback against expertise, that famous British minister still in office who said we'd all had enough with experts, seems not to notice that experts play an ever more important role in winnowing the chaff of deception from the grain of ascertainable fact every night on our television screens. But this responsibility, needless to say, implies some degree of self-discipline. Academics should speak in public only about what they truly know. And if they begin straying from their field of expertise, they can begin manipulating the prestige of their own disciplines. And when they do that, they make fools of themselves and mislead the public. But the responsibilities that go with academic freedom don't end there with being responsible to your discipline. There's also a duty beyond our borders, a duty of international academic solidarity towards those who belong like us to the global republic of letters. In 2021, the need for organizations like CARA and the Scholars at Risk chapters in many American and Canadian universities has never been greater. Democracy is in recession. Authoritarianism and single party rule are in the ascendant. And whenever this is the case, academic freedom is in danger. Consider these examples by no means exhaustive. You'll have your own examples, I'm sure. In Afghanistan, in the wake of the Taliban victory, women and girls have been sent home from schools and universities. And ac Afghan academics, whom I know, are desperate to lead, leave and write daily to their friends in the West seeking assistance to migrate. In Turkey, the Erdogan regime continues its crackdown on universities with show trials and dismissals and suspensions of entire uh, faculties since the failed coup attempt in 2016. And in China, universities have always been required to acknowledge the supreme authority of the Communist Party. But once upon a time, Chinese scholars, at least in the humanities and social sciences, were able to join the debates of the international scholarly community. And now they have to watch every word they say, both at home and abroad. And Uyghur writers and thinkers face much more severe penalties. In Myanmar, a, a university system which was just beginning to create the conditions of institutional autonomy, and I know a little bit about this because CEU is actively involved, those universities have now been crushed by the junta. In Russia, since the arrest and jailing of Alexei Navalny, Opp oppositional scholars and journalists are fleeing the country, convinced that freedom of thought is no longer possible in a country which, let's remember, um, gave us Lomonosov, gave us Sakharov, gave us some of the giants of modern science. In Hungary, um, as you probably know, um, Viktor Orban threw Central European University out of Budapest in 2019 and forced us to relocate to Vienna. And in its place, the Orban government invited a Chinese university from Fudan whose charter accepts the ultimate authority of the Communist Party. And whatever the hell they teach at Fudan in Budapest in years hence, you can be sure that not a word of criticism will be advanced towards either the Chinese regime or the Orban regime. That's how this is working. And it's happening in Europe, and we need to be aware of it. I was rector of CEU at the time, and uh, look back now on this episode from the safety of the university's new home in Vienna. And we need to draw sober conclusions, because despite the magnificent support from our fellow academics across Europe, including declarations from uh, British universities, despite the European Court of Justice proclaiming, pronouncing that the Orban action was illegal under European law, a member state of the European Union got away with the expulsion of a free institution from 
uh, a European member state. And that should tell us um, that the institutional defenses of academic freedom in Europe are much weaker than we think. And this authoritarian threat is not happening far away in countries of which we know little. It's coming much closer to home uh, in a way that I think we need to understand. The intelligence agencies of authoritarian governments, and I'm thinking here of China, Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and Russia, are spying on our foreign students in British universities, in European universities. Um, and let me give you an example of this directly from my, my own experience. In January 2021, a CEU master's student, uh, Ahmed Samir Santawi, returned to his native Egypt to visit his parents and complete his thesis research. He was arrested upon return, charged with posting opinions hostile to the government on his Facebook page while he was in Vienna with us, and he's now currently serving a four-year sentence in an Egyptian prison. And you can imagine the chilling effect that this has on other Egyptian students and other Egyptian scholars working in British universities, and we have some. This Egyptian example is not an outlier. I remember that when I was at the Harvard Kennedy School, where I taught between 2012 and 2016, Chinese students would come up to me and tell me in confidence that they chose their words carefully in my classes, lest one of their fellow Chinese students inform them to officials back home. So we need to understand what's going on here. Authoritarian regimes have understood that intellectual globalization, which has been such a tremendous benefit to, to all of our universities, poses a threat to them. When our foreign students who come to Britain to study with us learn what it is like to learn in freedom, they inevitably ask why they can't enjoy some kind of freedom at home. <clears throat> and so students from countries under authoritarian rule are watched when they study with us and when they return home. And this has the capacity to chill the emancipatory impact of free learning in our own institutions. What these examples tell us, I think, is that universities are in the front line of a battle between autocracy and democracy, a battle in which the minds of our students are the prize. It will be a challenge, as it was in the Cold War, to preserve the freedom of our classrooms and our research and not enlist in the geostrategic battles of our governments. Um, in the face of the rising drumbeat of ideological hostility towards China, which is coursing through the geostrategy of the world at the moment, universities need to balance a forthright defense of our own students, independent Chinese thinkers, while maintaining academic exchanges and contact with Chinese universities. And this is a tightrope to walk, which is going to be extremely difficult for universities to, um, to get across. So those are some thoughts about the threats to academic freedom that are coming at us from without, from the authoritarian resurgence around the world. I now want to turn, if you'll allow me, to some threats that are coming to academic freedom from within. Some of these are very familiar. Those who pay for universities or their programs, and I mean governments, foundations, alumni, corporations, necessarily exercise influence of influence over what we research and what we teach, even what students we recruit. But whenever universities accept money, they expose themselves to pressures, which it is the job of university administrators to manage without compromising the institutional autonomy on which academic freedom depends. And this is a morally complex area. It's just wonderful for universities to have loyal cohorts of alumni who want to invest in their alma mater, but it's not so terrific when the richest among them use the money to manipulate the university's teaching and research. It's terrific for universities to maintain research networks with Chinese or Russian or Middle Eastern universities, but it's not a good thing if the money that sustains these networks comes with strings attached that would forbid critical examination of the governments that do the funding. 
It's wonderful in my view, this is controversial, but it's wonderful for, in my view for universities to sustain close partnerships with big corporations, including pharmaceutical companies. And when the rules for these partnerships are clear and they contain clear specifications of public benefit, and the famous example of this is the Oxford partnership with AstraZeneca on COVID vaccines, the public, the university, and private corporations all benefit. But where the deals between universities and their corporate or government paymasters are opaque, where strings are attached, university autonomy comes into question. Universities are political communities, and its members have a right to know the particulars of any arrangement the university administrators make with governments, corporations, and foundations. And where public benefits are not defined, where profits prevail over the public good, the university community has to say so since institutional autonomy is the foundation of the academic freedom of each of us as individual professors. Any university president has a responsibility to safeguard that institutional autonomy from the pressure of money and insist that any financing arrangements are publicly disclosed and firmly aligned with the university's obligations to the public interest. All of this puts a lot of pressure on university leaders and having been one, I understand just what some of these pressures are like. And it underscores another point that we don't often understand, which is that there is nothing stable or secure about university autonomy in the 21st century. Why? Precisely because the university exerts more power in our societies than at any time in its history. The university's knowledge creation and credentialing authority has become the engine that powers the entire modern economy. University-created knowledge generates enormous value. And where enormous value is generated, interest pernicious to academic freedom can easily gain an unhealthy degree of influence over what research gets funded and what gets taught. And so universities should not allow their science departments to become adjunct research labs for private corporations. The university has to retain its freedom of research and fulfill its obligation to produce social benefits. And it also has to produce social benefits in a context when it also insists on its right to pursue totally useless knowledge for its own sake. Pure science, pure archival research, pure experimentation, divorced from profit or social use, in the confident expectation, which has been turned out time after time after time, that the most apparently useless research turns out to have the most powerful social benefits in time. In addition to these economic pressures on academic autonomy, there's some other pressures generated by our culture, by our politics, and by our inveterate human susceptibility to intellectual fashion. The question is whether universities remain capable of sustaining true freedom of thought and intellectual creativity, or whether, as some critics currently charge, universities have become covens of progressive political correctness, smothering contrarian thought, cushioning students in progressive platitudes, and in so doing, betraying the university's fundamental commitment to teach students not what to think, but how to think. So for part of the part of this sermon, um, my text will be the Royal Society's motto, Nullius in Verba. The founders of the Royal Society understood one of the paradoxes of intellectual freedom. Creativity is sociable, but truth is not. On the one hand, thinking goes best in a community. Your best thoughts, certainly my best thoughts, have occurred when listening silently to someone a lot smarter than me. And any contribution that I have made has only emerged in responding to some searching criticism of an idea that I had made the mistake of thinking was entirely unshakable. So all of the most painful learning we do is in dialogue, in academic 
and intellectual communities. And the Royal Society was founded as a community to make just this kind of intellectual exchange possible. And it was founded in the 1660s, let's remember, when universities themselves were dozing in dogmatic slumber. And as we know, universities do slumber from time to time. And the creation of the Royal Society was one of the things that helped to snap them awake. But at the same time, the founders of the society gave it a motto which made clear that in matters of science, proof should not turn even on their own members' word. Knowledge creation may be a social process, best conducted within institutions, but the test of truth is not social. It's not what a community says or a, mem a majority of its members say is true, but rather what the facts and the evidence will support. And this process of falsification and validation must not be dependent on opinion, convention, or received wisdom. Universities have always had to manage the paradox that the best thinking is done in company with others, but that original thinking that establishes new th truth is contrarian, refractory to common sense, antithetical to ideology, hostile to doctrine, and positively allergic to dogma. Great universities have always known how to manage this paradox, to create, on the one hand, the institutional environment, libraries, classrooms, disciplines, departments, colleges, that train minds to think together without allowing, without allowing an atmosphere to develop in which it becomes acceptable to teach students what to think. The paradoxical condition for intellectual originality, in other words, is a firm grounding in traditions of thought. And when our academic disciplines work as they should, they curate knowledge worth retaining and strain out opinions and theories that can be safely discarded. And this has the effect of funneling creative minds away from questions that have been answered to questions that need a new answer. Universities, therefore, are curators of knowledge. They clear away the knowledge that has failed us pointing bright minds to the frontiers of a discipline. And when we teach our students how to think, we give them a map, plus the skills to identify and then venture beyond that amazingly exciting place, knowledge's frontier line. Um, this is what university education is supposed to do, but recurrently we do something very different. Precisely because uh, knowledge and thinking are such sociable enterprises, in which what we think depends so much on those we admire, respect, or fear, we allow our own minds to be taken over by the trends, fashions, movements, and dogma that thanks to new technology now circulate with the speed of light. And I remember this from my own days as a graduate student at Harvard in the 1970s. I remember how vividly intellectual winds would gather outside the campus and then begin blowing through the campus, sweeping all of us before it like tumbleweed. First it was Marxism, then it was structuralism, then it was post-structuralism, then it was deconstruction. We can barely remember what the hell these things used to be saying, but believe me, at the time they were all powerful. Um, and some of our professors, thank God, stiffened our resolve to assess these fashions critically, while others succumbed and began preaching the new gospel. And these creeds that's always remembered promised liberation from outmoded dogma and allied themselves with progressive movements for social justice outside the campus. And my own work as a historian was changed, and I hope for the better, by the influence of some of these movements particularly the influence of some wonderfully ecumenical and broad-minded social historians who worked in the Marxist tradition. And their work was so full of life that it rescued the Marxist tradition from dogma and closure. So while some of these intellectual movements in the 70s and 80s did stimulate free thought, or at least did for me, others degenerated in time into closed language games for initiatives, but not before the ability to speak the language of the initiates was made the condition for hires, promotions, book contracts, and other indices of academic prestige. And in many a campus to this day, there are still professors on staff whose initial contract was earned by a capacity to perfectly imitate the language of the priesthoods of yesteryear. 
So what I take from my own academic training is that thinking for yourself in a university is not easy. Um, the relationship between academic thinking, academic freedom, and creative thought is problematic in the extreme. It's always a struggle to maintain our intellectual freedom, even in free institutions. Using the freedom that the academy promises about keeping some equipoise from the tidal waves of intellectual movements that sweep through the 21st century ca campus. None of this is easy. Sometimes it feels like trying to keep your footing in the middle of a gale. And this remains a challenge today. A wave of new thinking about race, empire, colonialism, and gender is sweeping through our campuses, transforming every discipline in the humanities and social sciences, and shaking up the politics of our democracies. Now, as you are all aware, there's a huge backlash against this woke and politically correct uh, trends. And these, this backlash is led by conservative forces mostly outside the university and some inside. But I think it's important, given that the backlash is underway, we should remember the immensely productive and liberating aspects of these movements, painful as their challenges have been. Thanks to the campaigns for women's rights that began in the 1960s and now have widened out to bring freedom and marriage equality to gay and trans people, we all live in a world that is a little bit freer from shame, from stigma, and from oppression. And the same transformative experience has occurred in relation to race and empire, with an especially destabilizing impact on national narratives, especially the British narrative, that we were once taught as children. We now understand how much of the wealth and privilege of European and American institutions, including universities, was built upon slavery and colonial exploitation. We now know something about the systematic institutionalized character of racial discrimination. So just as universities are on the front line of the 21st century battle between democracy and authoritarianism, we're also on the front line of our long deferred reckoning with a history of race, empire, and gender. And this reckoning is always already changing, I think for the better, mostly for the better, the curriculum we teach, the research subjects we choose to work on, and the contributions we make to public debate. And I hope the result will be a more troubling, complex, and pluralistic narrative of the national life of our country one that includes perspectives of those of our fellow citizens hitherto hidden from history. But it is precisely because these movements have a liberating potential that they pose dangers to free thought. Because they promise liberation from dogma, their adherents sometimes accord themselves the right to argue as if no sensible person can possibly disagree. If people do disagree, whether statues should be torn down, whether certain speakers should be deplatformed or disinvited, whether certain texts should be discarded from the canon. In other words, we have a fundamental disagreement about free speech itself. Uh, and, and some uh, of our uh, colleagues and friends believe that there's simply no argument to be had here. And what I'm trying to say is you bet there's an argument and it's not over. And both sides need to be heard, and we need to fight and argue this out. Um, and it includes debates about words that, whose meaning we thought was settled, words like sex and gender. Suddenly, we're looking at these words like explosive bombs that have to be you know, diffused to be used safely. So I would say also that we have been here before. The intellectual movements of the 1970s that I was so influenced by as a young student from Marxism to deconstruction also thought of themselves as progressive and all those who resisted as reactionary. The, what is different today is the polarization is not just ideological and political, it's now racial and sexual as well and therefore much more explosive because when intellectual claims become identity claims of a racial or sexual kind, the stakes become existential. 
People feel radically threatened because their identities are challenged and their reactions are likely to be strong precisely because they feel something essential to their very selves is being challenged. When you're not just defending an idea, but your moral identity as a person, you're likely to be pretty vehement in your defense and possibly intolerant in face of objection. And this is the slippery slope which can lead men and women in academic life to depart from the Royal Society's motto and to begin, on the contrary, to live by someone else's word, in short, to live within the protective shell of dogma under the compelling illusion that they are at last being authentically themselves. Now, universities have always given harbor and shelter to true believers, but it's difficult to sustain a climate of intellectual freedom in a campus full of true believers. Academic freedom and the intellectual creativity that should go with it presumes not just an ethics of civility in disagreement, but a capacity to distance your own identity from the propositions you uphold. It's only possible to admit that you're wrong if you can separate your identity claims from your truth claims. And it's only possible to live by the motto, take nobody's word for it, if you're sufficiently independent, even of progressive thought, to assert your own right to ascertain truth for yourself. So in conclusion, the ideal of academic freedom doesn't just make a claim about the epistemological conditions of democracy. It doesn't just make a claim about the interdependence of freedom at home and abroad. It's not just a claim about the need to defend the institutional autonomy of universities in an age where university knowledge generates the values, value that makes the world economy turn. To believe in academic freedom in the last instance is to make a deep claim about the conditions of free thought itself, that we must be tough enough to keep our identities out of arguments about truth, resilient enough to subject even liberating ideologies to the test of our intelligence, and finally honest enough about the truth to take nobody's word for it. Thanks for your attention. So, enormous thanks to Professor Ignatia for such a compelling lecture which um, shared those two characteristics of breadth of range but also depth of uh, intellect. We're going to now have an opportunity for questions and um, there is behind me a slide uh, which instructs us how to do it. Uh, I don't expect everybody to uh, obey these rules, by the way. This is, after all, a critical community. However, uh, if you wish to obey the rule, there's either a QR code that you can scan with, with, with an iPhone or whatever and type in a question, or if you haven't got the QR code in front of you, the code um, hash C2510 uh, will result in magically the question coming up on the screen behind me. So um, those are the rules of engagement uh, for the next few uh, minutes. So, it is always, however, the person who chairs the Q&A who has the privilege of asking the first question. So, if I may, uh, I'm absolutely intrigued by the way in which you characterised um, science and argument and fact and expertise. Really be interested in your reflections on the collision that we've seen in all of our nations in the last 18 months, where science intersects with public policy. Uh, where science doesn't speak with a single voice, where people are, and you, I think, mentioned the risk of scientists or other scholars stepping outside their area of expertise. And yet often the area of expertise is quite difficult to define. There is a risk when it comes to COVID. We, we can do basic characterization of the virus, but we don't yet know as much as we will eventually know about its transmissibility, about the risk for particular vulnerable groups in the population, and how... How can we improve from the lessons we've watched over the past few months in the dialogue uh, between science and different views of the science and the political response uh, in trying to give a rational approach to public policy in a hotly contested area? Oh, boy. Um, 
boy. Um, I, it's a wonderful question, and I, I'm, I'm doing what you're doing when you're struggling to think about how to answer. Um, I think we've all lived through this. It's been one of the most dramatic experiences of the relationship between science and politics, certainly in my lifetime. I, I, I can't remember an occasion in which um, you know, obscure, humble, hardworking epidemiologists, chemists, physicists, um, um, people who happen to know an awful lot about RNA vaccines are suddenly thrust into a, a public spotlight in a way um, and are having to contribute to a public debate on matters that are literally a matter of life and death. Um, and it must have been terrifying uh, for, for some of them early on. And it's been um, extremely difficult to get this right. And, and my kind of, um, because I've been in politics, my, my view is um, it's a miracle we've got anything right, really. Um, politicians have a set of drivers that are just different from scientific drivers. And the drivers for politicians are reassure, reassure, reassure. It's gonna be all right on the night, folks. You don't scare the horses. These are, these are, these are laws of political speech. They're, it, you know, to claim that it's just one damn fool politician or another is not true. All politicians work on that. Leadership is reassurance. Leadership is Trust me, we're going to get through this. This is a hell of a thing, folks, but I'm going to lead you through it. Um, but that's not a scientist's job. A scientist's job is to say, on the current trend line, we're going right off a cliff. On the current trend line, we're not going to get herd immunity, so stop talking about herd immunity. On current trend lines, uh, unless we get the vaccine developed, we're going to see a lot of people dying. And <clears throat> so a, 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 a scientist faced with... Um, the, the, the facts um, uh, is in a different discourse than a politician. A scientist should not be in the reassurance business. A scientist should be telling you what the graphs look like to him or her. And many of them have done, an, I think, an exemplary job in not being drawn into the, what I would call the false reassurance business. They've just don't, you know, I won't go there, you hear them saying and thinking. I'm going to stick with what I've got. Now, the second problem that you evoked, which is also, is that science is not speaking with one voice. And there are some very important debates within the scientific community about what these trend lines mean. Um, we've, we have, we've made a massive bet, which we don't talk about, which is that these vaccines are safe. And we're doing so on the basis that we have some, you know, we have peer review. We have, we have science is doing what science does, which is to check the morbidity statistics. We had trials. They were serious trials. They don't appear to have been messed with. So we have some confidence that when, you know, I've got, I've got two shots of Pfizer in my arm, and I want to be damn sure it's not going to kill me. And I'm trusting someone I've never met that they did the trials, and they, they didn't cut corners, and they looked at, you know, 74-year-olds like me or people with pre-existing conditions and, and did it. And if they didn't, um, we're all in a lot of trouble. So what do I draw from all this? I draw the conclusion and I don't want to say this in the Royal Society simply to make nice to scientists, but I'm incredibly impressed by this, the discipline of the scientific community, the care with which most of them have stayed within their lane and not gone into the reassurance business, um, the care with which they have not rushed results by and large. Um, we got a vaccine out, we got trials, but the trials were pretty substantial as far as I understand it. Um, and so on, on balance, I think science has come through well. The thing that is shocking to everybody is uh, the anti-vaccine view here. And, and, and I think we need, this is where 
political scientists and social psychologists ought to have a dialogue with natural sciences about because I don't understand it. I, I don't. I don't. I don't want to get in false disclosures, but there is some of this in my own family. Intelligent, smart people who just say, "I'm going to trust my immune system," and you think these are people I'm very fond of, and they're not. You know, they're not. They're not crazy right wingers, but they tell you that, and they tell you a lot of things that they've read in the newspapers about it, and you want to kind of shake them. But they happen to be your loved ones, and you know. I mean, so you know, what do you do? I don't. I'm kind of baffled by it, and it's it's troubling and 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 sad, and it means that I'm not going to get in a car with them. You know, I'm just not going to take the risk, right? So this, we need a social psychology, a social psychological understanding of the anti-vaxxer movement that is, <clears throat> we've somehow got to get non-ideological about it and try and understand for what it is. Because I think if we could understand that better, we could begin to whittle down the... Uh, <clears throat> the final thing I say, <clears throat> having praised science, is that one of the things that's happening everywhere is the claims of science when they get into the public domain are being questioned. And I think that's a damn good thing. I think it's entirely appropriate for some ignorant politician who's just been given a piece of paper by one of his assistants to stand in a, in a you know, hearing in the House of Commons going after scientists to get them to prove, you know, prove their point. I think science should be put through a shaking on this. But my, my view, just as a citizen, is that it's come through extraordinary well, and a lot of people are alive thanks to the courage and <clears throat> decency and hard work of scientists, many of whom are in the United Kingdom. God bless them. Well, on that note, I would very much recommend the book that Sarah Gilbert has brought out recently called Vaxes, uh, which gives the whole story of Oxford's development with AstraZeneca of, of, of those vaccines, yeah. an extraordinary self-deprecating account of science actually at work in the laboratory. I think the interesting thing is that when we talk about vaxxers and anti-vaxxers, there are two belief systems that are completely incompatible and talk quite completely against each other. Yeah. It goes back to one of your earlier points, I think, which is what is the influence of foreign states on suppressing rational debate? How far do they interfere through social media uh, in rational debate and influencing friends, colleagues, and relatives to take an anti-vaxxer stand? I've got on my little screen here some questions. All right. Um, so if I may, I'm going to start with one from Martin Cooper. He says, thank you for your lecture. What can a lowly research fellow do to help defend academic? By the way, there's no such thing as a lowly uh, research fellow, uh, but if there were, uh, what could they do to help defend academic freedom? Yes, I was a lowly research fellow myself one time, so I'm, I, I don't want to disagree with you, but we felt pretty lowly. <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, there are a couple of things to do. If, if uh, is it Martin asked the question? Mm -hmm. If Martin has a, any network of scientific research that takes him and connects to countries where academic freedom is in real jeopardy. I think it's immensely helpful to make contact and just look after your friends in the academic community. If you've got friends in Turkey, you know, take a, you know, just say, you know, how are you doing? Are you still able to publish? Are you still able to teach? I mean, these are, these are university systems that have just been devastated by authoritarian control. And so if you have any networks, I think it's very important to reach out. If you're a scientist or a social scientist working with uh, Chinese uh, people, you know, reach out, do what you can discreetly to find out just what are their conditions of work. Um, and sometimes if you can give them a year off, uh, you know, a fellowship in a uh, British or American University, that, that will be helpful. I think the other thing, finally, uh, is, you know, join your, join CARA. You know, if you're in the States, join Scholars at Risk. Um, you know, put some money in the pot. I mean, these, you know, I'm, this is a kind of benefit for this organization, and I, I wanted to do this lecture precisely because I think these things do make a, a difference, and the, and the history here is terribly important. 
you know, a bunch of academics in the 30s in Britain, you know, clubbed together and raised money and got people out of Nazi Germany. And, you know, we may have to do that kind of stuff again. And if they did it in the, in the 30s, we can do it in the, in the 21st century. And Cairo has been doing a magnificent job recently, of course, with Afghanistan uh, and other oppressive regimes. I mean, there's a c contradiction here to some extent, isn't there? Because you spoke in your lecture about the huge power of the modern university. It's a global institution with a global exchange of ideas. Those nations who suppress academic freedom and suppress institutional autonomy are going to see a decline in the quality and the value and the economic advantage of their universities. Do, do you actually see a turning point at some point in which this is a Damascan uh, realization that this is heading completely in the wrong direction? It's a great question, and it's crucially posed by, by China. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the university that is coming into Budapest to, to replace us is Fudan. Fudan's a serious place. And there's some very good departments. They do serious work. That's part of the reason why I, I have a sentence in the, the lecture about not wanting universities to enlist in the ideological battle of our governments. I mean, I think it's terribly important for universities to maintain contacts, even with universities that are not fully free. I, mean, I think there's some limit here that you know, gets a bit you don't want a lot of you don't want to invite a lot of government stooges to your next academic conference. But if you can find honest minds, and there are you know tons of honest minds and good souls in Chinese universities, you want to you want to get them over, and not enlist your your institutions in some in China bashing. Um, will China then discover that they pay a price, which is your question? Will Russia pay a price? I mean, you know, so the social sciences and humanities in, in Russian universities have taken a horrible pounding. And in many ways, as I understand it, the, the, the natural sciences have some of that kind of um, funding and autonomy that they had in the, um, in the Soviet period simply because they're so important for the uh, productivity and prestige of, of the society. But, you know, Russia is a good example. This is a society that, apart from oil and primary commodities, is not producing knowledge. I mean, it, it, this is not, this is a society that is not um, generating the kind of university-based knowledge that can transform an economy. And, you know, Putin likes that just fine, frankly. I think he thinks, I will, I'm going to ride this out on, 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 on high commodity prices. Natural gas, I'm going to stick it to the Europeans, I'm going to stick it to everybody. This green energy can transition all you Western Europeans like is great for me. I just keep jacking up the pr so so i don't need in the intellectual benefits of a free academic situation long term it's a disastrous strategy for any society to shut down academic freedom i think the crunch will also come however in china where, where china understands that knowledge is the generator of modern economic growth and if you stifle knowledge you eventually pay a price not just for the universities, but for the regime is the point. But, you know, Xi Jinping has made it absolutely clear there is one priority, which is maintaining the power of the Communist Party of China in perpetuity. And academic freedom is the least, least thing on his mind. And that's a tragedy for a country with a, 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 a towering scientific tradition. Well, in obedience to your earlier injunction of engaging with these regimes, I've got to confess to having spent seven years advising the Russian government on the renaissance of its universities. Uh, and yes, there is an interest in investing significantly in them, but at the same time, the politics of the nation are so complex uh, that the opportunity for autonomy within these universities is very hard indeed. Yeah. Uh, the leadership tends to be of another era. Uh, the younger people are not being captured and developed in the way in which we would in a university in the West. So there are many cultural 
uh, challenges as well as obviously the, the political attitude of, of Putin and his team. So look, let's go into another question from here. So I have one from Robin Grimes saying, you reminded us of the freedom to pursue research for its own sake, with benefits sometimes long in the future. But to what extent is it the responsibility of the researcher to ensure that knowledge is available to society? How do we balance that uh, with freedom and responsibility? Hmm. That is also a real question, again, which is what you say when you're playing for time. Um, <laughs> I think university knowledge has, um, in the aggregate, uh, universities in the aggregate, that is, universities seen from the perspective of, of a university administrator, as I once was, clearly wants to be saying all the time, from the moment it gets up in the morning to the moment you go to sleep, um, here are the things that we do for society in return for the funding, in return for the support, here's what we generate. It's part of the politics of universities. But this is not, that's not the question. The question from an individual researcher is why the hell should I be, you know, why should the hell should I contribute to, you know, the, the, the benefit of the university? Why should I contribute to the benefit of UK PLC? You know, I mean, and, and you, and there is a moment where if you press that as a university administrator on individual uh, researchers, they quite rightly say, "Go to hell." I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm interested in medieval paleography, and that is my life. And you know, thank you very much. And, and since I'm a historian, that immediately shuts me up because I, you know, I know that medieval paleography has done extraordinary things to our understanding of the medieval past, and I don't want to force the the poor woman to. Um, give public lectures pretending this has immediate social benefit. So, you know, that, that, that's how we maintain academic freedom. We let people research a lot of things that half of the world thinks are a total waste of time. And we, we, we need to do that, it seems to me, in part because um, uh, the number of transformative ideas uh, it, generated universe is quite small. Most of the time we're not creating fantastic new knowledge. We're actually curating, you know, stockpiling, moving a book from one shelf to another, as it were, adding another little book. We do, you know, it's important to be very humble about what we do, and that creates, I think, the right perspective in which it just is inappropriate to push um, our fellow colleagues and researchers to be more useful. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't, as a university president, I wouldn't dare to do that. I mean, occasionally you dangle incentives. Let's, let's also get real here. You dangle, you know, there's a nice fat pot of money if you'd like to, you know, and, but thank God most people are entirely indifferent to the little pots of money that I dangle in front of them. I mean, some are. Some, and sometimes it's the mediocre, mediocrities in your faculty who respond to the incentive. So, you know, I, I, um, so I, I distinguish sharply between the aggregate position of a university, which seems to me it has to justify itself, uh, and the individual position where I think people really have to be free to walk up every damn blind alley they choose. I loved your expression in your lecture when you spoke about uh, generating useless knowledge. <laughs> now, we know in this room what that means. It may look useless today, but it may have infinite value in X years' time. What is more concerning is when that discourse gets into the public, into the political mm. arena, mm. and politicians say, well, why don't we shut down the departments of useless knowledge? I don't know, history, for example. Mm. Um, and we're getting dangerously into that arena in some countries. Australia has been going through this, and this, in this part mm. of the discourse here in the UK. I mean, what do you say to um, defend academic freedom, uh, which is under threat because of a changed set of political uh, priorities which do not reflect the underlying values of a university? Well, we're in the middle of that at the moment, aren't we? I mean, I, I'm very struck because I, I subscribe to the Times 
And so I barely a day passes when I turn on my screen and see some controversy in the British press about somebody, the University of Sussex is going through a, um, a bit of this at the moment. Um, I, have a, I happen to have a very good student at CU who was chair of the Oriel College JCR in Oxford and so was in the center of the whole controversy about roads must fall. Um, and uh, there's a lot of media interest, and where there's media interest, politicians quickly gather like flies. Having been one, I can say that kind of thing. Um, and I think that university presidents are often tempted to leap in because the issue is reputational immediately. And, um, and when they leap in, it's often a terrible mistake, and there's where real violations of academic freedom can, can happen. I mean, I know, because at Harvard, a very close friend of mine, um, who is dean of students, uh, lost his job like that because there was some racial issue, which I will not describe, in which he took a position that was slightly controversial. In my view, it was firmly on the side of the gods. But the university came down like a ton of bricks immediately, sensing reputational harm. And, um, and that's, a, that's, I think, a pernicious development. I think it's very important for university administrators and presidents and vice chancellors to stand back. It's painful because there's no question that it doesn't do Sussex a whole hell of a lot of good to, to have this, this controversy. And I think it's utterly intolerable. I mean, let's be clear, intolerable that um, a, a professor of philosophy is being harassed in this way. I just think it's ridiculous and it's contemptible and it's very bad for universities across the UK. But I think it's, you, in, a, in a sense, you've got to let this play out um, because there are things, uh, um, there are things a, a university could do that I think would make things worse. On, at the same time, I think it's also important for university, universities to say once, twice, a thousand times what academic freedom means on the ground. I mean, give you an example from my own experience. At CEU, I invited Roger Scruton of late lamented memory um, to give a talk at CEU attacking um, liberal democracy, attacking the liberal view of liberal democracy. And uh, he came, uh, gave the lecture, and as he rose to speak, I introduced him, as he rose to speak, 60 of my students walked out so they wouldn't have to listen. And I said in the lecture, I just thought, you know, <laughs> I put Roger Scruton on this platform not because I agree with everything I say, but because it's very important that he has the right to speak, and it's not going to kill you to listen to him. Listening to him does not imply that you agree with him. Your presence in the room is not a validation of Roger Scruton. You're making a category mistake here, and in so doing, your unwillingness to even listen to what he says is, I think, a disgrace. So it's not as if I don't think universities, presidents, and stuff should stand up, and I have done so. Um, but we also have to welcome the fact that we're, we're, we're the community, we're the institution in modern societies where the question of what freedom is and what free speech is is most passionately debated. We're the place where it's happening. And so we ought to relax about it and, you know, let it happen, but smothering it, trying to shut it down, trying to regiment it, trying to, to you know, get everybody to agree to some common code, it's just not gonna happen. These things are too explosive, too passionately held. I and mean, their objection to Scruton was not about his conservatism, but about his entirely retrograde attitude towards homosexuality as it happened. That's what really bothered them. Well, you know, these, these, these views, I mean, as I say, th this is where universities and our institutions are on the front line of a vital battle. 
And managing it, I, I found, was extremely difficult. I think um, everybody who's been in that role knows that. I mean, if you take on a role nowadays as a vice chancellor or university president, you know that you are inheriting the battlefield. Yes. Uh, and some of the battles are taking place only on a very small part of the campus, some distance from the rest of the activity, but they're still on the front page of the newspaper, and they still require a measured response uh, from the leadership of the institution. So may I take you now up to another question that's come through from the audience? It's from Talia, and it says, how might academies like the Royal Society most effectively advocate for academic freedom when it's under threat? Well, as your, your foreign minister said in his introductory remarks, you've already put out, as I understood it, a, a, a declaration in these matters. And the Royal Society is, you know, um, I think the issue for you, like any great institution, is to husband your and conserve your authority and use it wisely. I mean, not squander it. You don't want to be opining and pronouncing on every damn thing because it, it, it weakens your impact. So, you know, you've got to have a sort of shrewd political judgment as that there might be some moment, I can't predict what it was, in which, say, a, I don't know, let's imagine the moment. A, you know, the prime minister gets up and makes an attack on, you know, the uselessness of scientific research or the, the hopeless chaos in universities, and I, the prime minister, are going to do something about it. I could conceive of that being a moment when the Royal Society would have to get up and say, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> you know, what the hell are you talking about? You know what I mean? And just push back in the name of the 300, 400 years of history that you incarnate. But you want to do that. You, you, you want to do that very, very selectively, very, very carefully, because you can then fritter away the enormous prestige that you have as an institution. So it requires being politically very, very smart, and I can't give you advice. And many institutions um, uh, get this wrong. Um, in the United States, um, Robert Zimmer, the president of the University of Chicago, um, put out a, went to the trouble of putting out a kind of very robust definition of, of, of academic freedom and how that would be enforced at the University of Chicago. And that, I think, on balance, was very productive because it simply says, here's where I am, guys. Do you want to, you want to line up with me or not? And a lot of people lined up with, with Simmer on this, and I thought that was a, a kind of exemplary use of, of institutional authority. Um, but... Uh, um, you're going to have to show a great deal of political wisdom and I think a lot of restraint. Uh, so come back then to your, your, your example of, the, of, of a prime minister who announces that this, this is all bad and universities are going to rot, whatever. It brings me to another question that's on the list here because it's a matter also of the interdependence between the leadership of the university and the funding capability of the government. Uh, and the question was... Um, how, any musings on how government funding of universities affects academic free speech for good or ill and the funding of science research in particular? Mm. I want to be hesitant about talking about that because I'm, I've not been a vice chancellor in a, in a British citizen system and I haven't been on a, one of your research institutions so I don't know how the the lever is worked, you know what I mean? I, I, it's easy to speculate that a minister of higher education or a, um, the people, um, the chancellor, when he comes to you know, fund um, scientific research could, could put the squeeze on. And my, my sense of how British institutions work is that there's a lot of kind of quiet meetings you never hear about and stuff gets worked out. And <clears throat> there, I think, um, um, universities, uh, if they, again, it's like answer to the previous question, if they use their prestige and authority wisely, they don't have to, they don't have to go public. They can mm. be, be, they can negotiate this out successfully in, um, private. And I, I think one thing I said in the lecture, I, I, I believe, and that's, it's very difficult to get this right, universities are incredibly powerful institutions now in the, in the 21st century economy. I mean, they just are 
the decisive place where uh, you know innovation and growth and the formation of um, our labor force and the formation of our culture and everything happens. They're just central. And so the, it's really a question of how they use this enormous power as opposed to being kind of simply supplicant, pathetic creatures, you know, waiting for the political, you know, foot to drop. I mean, they've got to say, you know, if you want to have a, if you want to have a really open, dynamic, creative society, don't screw around with universities and don't screw around with scientific, just leave it alone, do you know what I mean? Just try not to mess it up, you know? But it's very difficult to do that and, and it requires superb political skills from your vice chancellors and all that. And I, I can't say more than that. I mean, <clears throat> there's no question that he who calls, he who pays the piper calls the tune. There's no question at the end of the day, and that's why I have a paragraph about money in my talk. I ran a private university exclusively funded by a billionaire. And I can tell you, not easy. Not easy to, to maintain the institutional autonomy of the institution when all the money, with some exceptions, comes from one 92-year-old you know, Holocaust survivor, hedge fund billionaire, unbelievable human being, but occasionally he would want things that just struck me as being batty, and you have to kind of politely <laughs> say, you know, I don't think so, you know. And, and fortunately, I mean, fortunately he understood academic freedom a good deal better than Viktor Orban. And <laughs> Well, there's one more question. I think one of the reasons why universities can be very powerful, I think, is political understanding of the global competitiveness of their universities. You've seen this drive the reforms in China, Japan, Russia, France, and Germany as the restructuring has occurred to strengthen universities for reasons largely of national pride. Why are our universities not high up on the list of, uh, of, of the global league tables? Mm -hmm. Let me just put to you the final questions coming from Dan Shah. How do you think the freedom and capability of non-academic publics to engage with science and research relate to the freedoms of academics? Can I have that again? Mm -hmm. Something I didn't, I just didn't. Right. Um, how do you think that the freedom and capability of non-academic publics to engage with science and research relates to the freedom of the academics. And you talked about the, mm. the different freedoms in yeah. your lecture. That's also a, 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 you know, a tremendously <coughs> good question. And, it, and it, it illuminates, I think, the, some of the political difficulties that science and the universities have in relation to the public. Um, they think we're a bunch of spoiled, credentialed brats who have an easy, cushy life. And there are a lot of people for whom, um, we, you know, with a hunger for knowledge and even a respect for knowledge, but whose lives have not made it possible for them to benefit from university education or benefit from access to science. And so, and we need to understand that that's a, a, a lot of people. Um, and then think about how we can um, extend, renew, develop um, the kind of popular education that uh, universities have uh, sometimes been able to do. Um, And then we have to get that right. I mean, um, it means improving access to university education. It means also um, the internet is making it possible. I mean, I, the famous example, but it is an interesting one, is the University of Arizona. You know, they have 100,000 students taking you know, courses in their campus at Tempe and other places. And they have kind of a million people taking courses on, online. So there's a tremendous amount that can be done, it seems to me, um, to take uh, science to the public, take knowledge to the public. And, and we haven't, this is not social work. 
I mean, if we don't do that, we're going to get more and more populist revolts from the, from the conservative right that make us the enemy. Um, and, and there is a curdling resentment of <clears throat> credentialed middle class people who think that only their opinions matter. And this is a political problem. So you, you want to go at that with a, a university that is open, that is reaching out. Um, and this country has, in some ways, a, a heroic and really interesting record of popularization of science. You have the greatest scientific communicator on earth still alive, David Attenborough. And that's not a minor fact. In his own way, he's done more to take science to ordinary people than any other person on the planet. And the traditions of public broadcasting that made that possible are a huge achievement. As someone who's no longer here anymore, I see clearly that you know, from the, from the 1950s onwards. And David Attenborough was made possible by a whole culture of public education using the advanced medias of the time from the, you know, from, from, um, from the, you know, from the beginning of the BBC onwards. And now it's, some of it's in the private broadcasters. So that's a huge um, asset and it mustn't be allowed to die because it deals with this, this issue of, of the curdling resentment of the excluded. If, if, you don't have, if you don't have scientific education undertaken by these brilliant communicators, um, then I think universities themselves will get more and more isolated and more, and, and, and more, and more the subject of kind of um, resentment-filled populist hostility. And some of it exploded in Brexit in a way that was shocking to, to, to everybody. <clears throat> but I think we need to think about um, why that happened and redouble our efforts to say, you know, the stuff we know belongs to everybody. And, and also, more directly, you paid for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, there's a contract here and it needs to be constantly restated. Um, so. Right. Well, a very good note to end the q and A. I'm, oh, it gives me enormous pleasure to invite Professor Michael Wharton to come and help us close this session. Michael. Thank you, Malcolm. Right, I want to do two things here. One is, is to thank Michael for um, his lecture, and the second is just to tell you one or two things about what we're doing at CAR at the moment. But Michael, that was a, a truly marvelous lecture. It was thoughtful, it enlightened us, it inspired us, it challenged us, it provoked us, and it even um, decided to chide us. Um, I, I speak here as a long-lapsed post-structuralist and deconstructionist, <laughs> but I remember all too well what happened um, when I renounced my certainties. Um, <laughs> some of my students refused to speak to me or attend my classes for a year. <laughs> I hope some of them lost their faith as well, but I remember well the certainties that we had as adherents of what at the time was one of these great movements um, of which you spoke. As um, Professor Ignatieff pointed out, as democracy is in recession and populism, authoritarianism and single party rule continue to be in the ascendant, we do all, all of us worry about the future of academic freedom. Um, but also I think that what was interesting was that from the very start of um, his lecture, he was constantly in a state of balance, keeping us in balance as one position was contrasted with another. Because he pointed out also with forensic scrutiny and characteristically exquisite um, eloquence that there are almost as many threats from within um, higher education um, and not only in other places, but in Europe, in Britain. I don't know how many of you have been involved in responding to the government's policy paper on higher education that was published back in February, but we have a lot of work to do in this country to try and 
persuade them that woke culture is not the only issue um, at stake in um, academic freedom. I think also that all of us, I'm sure, in this room feel that it is incumbent on us to respect and to promote international academic solidarity as the Royal Society has done so, so well um, recently. But this isn't a simple issue. And I was fascinated when listening to what you were saying, Michael, about China um, and how we respond to that. Thinking back to a few weeks ago when um, I was in France and discussing with some colleagues there um, what to do in certain cases. Does one remain silent on the treatment of the Uyghurs in China or of women in Saudi Arabia or Afghanistan? Does one speak openly or not about the theft of intellectual property by foreign students for the benefit of their countries? What do we do? And of course, listening to you, I began to understand a way through because very often when we talk about academic freedom, we do move into a certain kind of binarism. And you are constantly reminding us that we must not, we must not be seduced by the binarism which has shaped so much of our, our thinking over, over the past centuries. But there are other ways of, of dealing with things. As history teaches us, silence can, of course, easily become betrayal. But moral issues, ethical issues, do have to be balanced with others. They are not the only issues. And as I was listening to the lecture, I was beginning to feel that you were helping all of us to move slightly forward in how we think about this, that the black and white of academic freedom is perhaps um, better shaped and better understood as a, a series of greys shifting um, their own depth, um, rather as in a, a Whistler painting. I also found it enormously helpful in the way that you addressed and found some kind of answers to the questions precisely through their own complexities. Many of us are struggling, as indeed Malcolm was picking up also, with what's happening with this wave of rethinking about race, empire, colonialism, and, and gender. We are, we are really, really struggling. And in the universities with which um, I'm associated, we have made really bad mistakes, really bad mistakes, by responding too quickly, or by responding too clumsily, by not listening, by not knowing how to listen, and also by not being certain of where we stood. And this whole notion of uncertainty and struggling with certainty, knowing that certainty in some ways is good if it is truth, but certainty is also very dangerous if it is a delusion. And so this is why I found enormous courage um, in your argument when you were arguing that precisely because these movements are so, or have such liberating potential that they can become dangerous. Your argument is both subtle and I think powerful. And as you were giving us example after example, I was finding the power taking over more and more. Finally understanding, um, as you were concluding, that we must be, and I quote you here, let me just get it, um, we must be tough enough to keep our identities out of arguments about truth. That's so right and so difficult to do. And what we perhaps need to do ourselves, but also with all of our students, is just remind them of this. This is the path that we do need to follow. So, so much insight, so much wisdom in your lecture, Michael, and so many rallying cries to think further. In your talk, you reminded us that in our universities, we are obliged, or our mission should be, to teach our students how to think and not what to think. And I think this evening that you have taught us all how to think a little differently ourselves and how to think a little better. So we owe you a huge debt for your talk this evening and for all the ripples and movements of change that will continue after the talk as we think more about what you said. But ladies and gentlemen, please thank Professor Michael Edmartia for your lecture.
Um, I'd first of all like to start by thanking um, our partners, the Royal Society, for hosting us here um, and partnering us um, with the lecture so well. It's always great to work with you. Just to bring you up to date with where you are, we're always asked at the moment about what's happening in Afghanistan. What's happening at CARA on Afghanistan is an awful lot. What the product of that is less visible. Um, very, very few people have managed to, academics at risk in Afghanistan, have managed yet to escape from Afghanistan and come to the sanctuary here in the UK. But our, our wonderful, wonderful team under um, Stephen Wordsworth's um, exemplary leadership are dealing daily with inquiries. At the moment, we've already got 220 live applications regular telephone contact with people in hiding in Afghanistan, terrified about who might be listening into their phone calls and so on. We're enormously grateful to the many, many universities in the UK who have made offers of help, of funded places. But what we have to do is to match the eligible candidate with the department in the right university, the right kind of department. So there's a lot of work that we're doing for when we can manage to get them out. And our team is, always, is working very, very hard on this. And indeed, it should be said that actually getting some real help from the Home Office, which is not always the case, um, but it's very good that they are helping us on this. And it, it, it's good just occasionally be able to say they, they seem to understand that they do need to help. But there is so much more to be done. We do all talk about... Afghanistan, as we once did several years ago, about Syria. And yet our Syria programme is still running. Um, we've had to stop in-person meetings because of COVID, um, but we're, we're still highly engaged with all of the exiled um, Syrian colleagues in the region, um, many of them, in, most of them in, in Turkey, but also in Jordan, Lebanon, and so on. But it's not just Syria. It's those from Myanmar, those from Hong Kong, those from the Yemen. And for all those who are suffering, or wherever they are, because of what they say, because of what they believe, and quite simply, for who and what they are. For these people, the people that Cara um, is seeking to help, academic freedom is quite literally, with no hyperbole, a question of life and death. We must never, ever forgot, forget that, that fact. This is reality of many of our colleagues in the world. So please, please help us to help more of them. I was very grateful to Michael at the beginning of his talk. He already was beginning the commercial that is coming um, <laughs> more now. That we do need your help. We're a charity. Um, there are many people in this room who help us individually. There are many people in this room who help us institutionally. There are many people who help us through other charities who are in this room. So we are very grateful to all of them. But we do need to do more and more and more. If there's one thing that would make perhaps the biggest difference, apart from having um, a George Soros to fund us totally, although it should be said that the Open Society Foundation is one of the two main funders of our Syria programme with the Mellon Foundation for the Humanities and, and the Arts. But um, what would make the biggest difference, and this is something where each of you can make a, a significant contribution yourself, is that one, if you're feeling bounteous, go to our website and you'll find our donations page and it's very easy to give whatever you individually would like to do. But we have another vision which is to try and involve the individual body of um, universities in the UK, as much as the universities themselves of the UK are engaged in the work of CARA. And this is through our 10 by 20 programme, where our vision is to try and get 10% of people working in British universities to give £20 per year on direct debit. So not an enormous investment for individuals, if we got 10% of people involved in that, we could quadruple what we're doing. So that is really, and yet this would mean for the individual involved, really quite a small contribution of their annual income. So we are slightly puzzled why we haven't 
quite <laughs> caught the imagination of academics and others working in the universities. Anything you can do to your colleagues throughout the university system to encourage them just to think about how, if we can get the wave moving, to become not a tidal wave of intellectual liberalism or populism or whatever, but a wave of a desire to help those who need us in their real time of need. Please, please, please try and persuade as many to do that. Also on our website, you'll find our annual report, which has a, um, a particularly gloomy cover. We also have some um, hard copies today, if anyone would like to read it. But it just it indicates the range of what we're doing and the range especially of the people who are working with us. And I think that's one thing that um, has impressed me enormously over the past 18 months when we've all been in enormous, enormously difficult um, positions as we try to take our institutions um, through COVID and the allied challenges is the sense in which more and more people are working with us. So please please think of us, help us in any way, and please, please give. And now if you would join with us, I'd be very grateful just for some drinks and canapes so that we can continue talking about Michael's wonderful lecture and also about how we can help more of our colleagues in countries less benighted, much, much more benighted than, um, than our own. Thank you very much.